Hello. Today I want to talk to you about x-rays. What are they? Where do they come from? And how are they used to make our lives better? Step into my radiology lab to find out more about the many facets of this technology. First, let's talk about what x-rays actually are. Imagine you wanted to see through closed doors, walls, or even the human body. Normal light wouldn't do it. So we need to reinvent light. We would need a kind of ray that's so powerful that you could look inside of things. Now we refer to the light the human eye can see as white light, and it's made up of electromagnetic waves within a certain bandwidth. Electromagnetic waves are used for lots of things, like microwaves, radio waves, and even TV. We cannot see them, but nevertheless, these waves may be useful. Now, these waves are what we call X-rays. And if I say the word X-ray, you probably think of something like this. And that's because, at some stage, you have probably already had an X-ray. So you know that physicians often use X-rays when they want to see what's going on inside us. When using X-rays in conventional radiography, the physician can see certain kinds of soft tissue, like lungs, and hard tissue, like bones. If we need to see other parts of the body that X-rays alone won't show, we need a special fluid called a contrast agent. The physician applies the contrast agent to the area he wants to see. It's denser than normal soft tissue, so it absorbs more rays and makes the tissue like the digestive system, kidneys, or veins, visible. Conventional X-ray systems can only generate shadow-like images. With the use of a contrast agent and techniques like computed tomography, angiography, and molecular imaging, physicians are able to look at different areas of the body from different angles. Computed tomography, for example, generates cross-sectional images of the body that look just like slices of a cucumber. The physician can actually scroll through any region of a patient's body. Moving parts of the body need another special technique. So to see how your heart beats or how your digestive system works, we use a technique called fluoroscopy, which is just like film. All films are a series of still pictures, and if we play them fast enough, the pictures are blurred into one moving scene. Fluoroscopy does the same with X-ray images. So X-rays are useful tools for lots of things, but they're mainly used in the following situations. First, after an accident, physicians might need to see how badly the patient has been hurt, and they have to make sure just where the actual damage is. Thus, X-rays are an important tool for quick diagnosis. Secondly, X-rays are used in many situations where a suspected disease needs to be ruled out or confirmed, and then specified. In case of suspected cancer, for instance, formerly exploratory surgery was often needed to see if a patient really had cancer. Nowadays, X-rays can often help answer this question without surgery. Thirdly, physicians use X-rays as a visual guide during a special kind of surgery. These operations are endoscopic, which means they're performed with very small tools that are inserted into the body through tiny holes. So the surgeon needs x-rays in order to see what he's doing. And lastly, x-rays are used to monitor the healing process of certain kinds of injuries. And thus, the physician can see how well the treatment is working. So as you can see, a lot of modern medicine would be impossible without x-rays. X-rays aren't limited to the medical environment. They have lots of applications, for example, in the area of security. I'm sure you've had your bag scanned at the airport. Those are x-rays too. The machines used to scan carry-ons, check luggage, cargo containers, and so on, can distinguish between organic, inorganic, and metallic materials and deliver a colored output image. Different colors 
show the various materials, and security professionals can easily spot dangerous substances. Archaeologists, too, rely on x-rays. For example, to look inside objects that are thousands of years old and would be damaged if opened. But beyond healthcare and security, the most important use of x-rays is in industry. Here they're used for non-destructive testing and to help find defects in castings, structures, and welds without destroying the thing being tested. This means it's possible to test every unit for quality and not just one or two out of thousands. So where do x-rays come from? Well, it's really very simple. If you want to make red light, all you need to do is shine white light against the red object. The light that is reflected back is now red. Producing x-rays is nearly as simple, but instead of using light, you shine a beam of electrons against a certain kind of metal, for example, tungsten. What gets reflected back is neither light nor electrons, but a beam of x-rays. Generally speaking, the higher the voltage you use to accelerate the electrons, the faster they crash into the tungsten, and the higher the energy of the x-rays they produce. This means the power of the x-rays can be finely tuned for every kind of examination. The part of the x-ray system where x-rays are produced is called the x-ray tube. It's one of the two main parts of an x-ray system. The other part is called the detector. Taken together, they work just like a normal camera. On a camera, the light gets focused through a lens, which opens and shuts very quickly onto a light-sensitive chip, and this captures the image. Of course, with an x-ray system, it's not light, but x-rays. X-rays are a form of radiation. In fact, all forms of electromagnetic waves are radiation. That's where the word radio comes from. Radiation is everywhere. For example, sunlight is a type of radiation. And it's not just the sun. Virtually everything emits radiation. The ground we stand on, and the bricks in the buildings around you. Even your TV and computer monitor emit radiation. And since the dose is so low, we know it doesn't harm us. Let's talk about the sun. We know if we stay out too long in the sun, we get sunburned. So we do different things to guard ourselves against the sunlight. We might stay in the shade, or use sunblock, and perhaps wear sunglasses. We know that although sunlight is good for us, it even provides crucial vitamins for our bodies, too much sun is bad for us. So, like so many things in life, it's all a question of the amount. The doses involved in most x-ray procedures are small in comparison with all the other rays we're exposed to in our everyday lives. However, it is of vital importance to handle each case of medical radiation exposure with great care. This means that the medical necessity of an imaging procedure needs to be well considered by your physician. Now let me put some numbers together to help you understand the amount of dose needed for x-ray procedures. But before we do that, I need to explain one term. When we measure how our bodies react to radiation, we use a unit called a millisievert. We'll be using this term in our comparisons. Depending on where we live, each and every year, through sunlight, earth radiation, and other sources like air travel or working in front of a computer screen, we're exposed to a total dose on the average of about four millisieverts. Just like we need sunlight, we sometimes need an x-ray. For example, after an accident, or when our physician needs to take a look inside us to make a diagnosis. But as already mentioned, the use of imaging technologies needs to be thoroughly considered and justified. Remember, every person is exposed to a certain amount of background radiation each year, depending on where you live on our planet. For the population of Berlin, the yearly exposure is, for example, 0.3 millisieverts, whereas for the population of La Paz, Bolivia, it's 2 millisieverts. Now, we can use these numbers 
to put the dose that's emitted by an X-ray system in some perspective. For example, when our head or lungs are examined with a conventional X-ray system, we're exposed to about 0.2 millisieverts. That's about the same dose as three weeks of normal life or of one transatlantic flight. Let's take a look at some other examples. An examination of our abdomen would result in 0.3 millisieverts, which equates to four weeks of normal exposure. Examining our pelvis would be 0.1 millisieverts, or nine days of normal exposure. And an examination of our entire rib cage would expose us to about three millisieverts, which is still less than the normal annual background radiation for most of us. We always consider the dose in the context of various circumstances. For example, the weight of the patient. A bigger person can tolerate a higher dose than a smaller one. So children in particular should not receive as high of a dose as an average adult. This is the reason when we get an x-ray, the patient's weight is taken into account. And talking about children, they are also more sensitive to radiation because their cells are still developing. This is why cell mutations, which might be caused by radiation, would tend to spread faster in children. You might be wondering whether there are any rules regarding the dose that a patient may be exposed to. Actually, medical licensing agencies do require that a person may only be exposed to the minimum dose necessary for the specific imaging procedure required. According to these guidelines, radiologists and x-ray technicians are trained in how to use the lowest achievable amount of radiation to obtain the diagnostic information they need. Here's another thing. X-rays are only produced the moment when the switch is turned on. Like with visible light, there's no radiation left when the switch is turned off. So it's completely safe to be in the examination room before and after an x-ray image is taken. Still, it makes sense to keep a record of your personal x-ray history so that you know, even if you change physicians, what kind of image was taken when, and if a new one is really needed. Regulations to reasonably limit the amount of exposure are one thing. On the other hand, imaging technology was optimized over the years in order to further reduce the amount of radiation needed for precise clinical images. This is why modern systems, like this X-ray system or this CT, have a whole series of features whose only function is to minimize the amount of X-rays entering your body. Here's one. It's a copper filter, and it works something like sunglasses which allow light to your eye, but not too much. On top of that, there are other safety precautions. On the beach, we use extra sunblock on sensitive areas. Here, aprons made of material that x-rays cannot pass through are laid across parts of your body to prevent unnecessary x-rays from touching you in any way. I think it's time to look at the different kinds of x-rays in detail. Radiography is the most common technology, so let's talk about that first. Radiography for diagnostic procedures is like taking a single photograph. It's a one-time exposure that results in one x-ray image. Just like when you press the release button on a camera. When people talk about getting an x-ray, it's normally conventional radiography they're talking about. Some of the most common examinations are projections of the chest, spine, or ribs. The second type of x-ray I want to talk about is called fluoroscopy. Now fluoroscopy is like a movie. So instead of the camera taking one picture, it takes a series of images. The radiologist can play these back and see real-time moving images of the inside of the patient. Physicians often use this method when they want to see how your stomach is working. During a computed tomography, also called CT, several thousand images are taken in one rotation, resulting in one complete cross-sectional image of the body. The x-ray tube keeps rotating and acquiring images, while the patient table moves gradually through the gantry. Today it's possible to do a full body scan in sub-millimeter slices 
in less than five seconds. Quite impressive, huh? Imagine you have to cut this cucumber. into fine slices within five seconds. With the resulting image slices, it's possible to look at the body from different angles and to actually scroll through the body to take a closer look at certain areas. Compared with conventional x-ray, which produces 2D displays of superimposed structures, CT creates something resembling a 3D image. Another type of x-ray is angiography. Angiography is a special kind of fluoroscopy that's used to see blood vessels like arteries, veins, and the chambers of the heart, as well as other organs. In general, physicians use angiography to see blockages or narrowings inside a vessel. It's especially useful when it's necessary to take a closer look at your heart. Another form of x-ray is mammography a special examination of the breast. During a mammography procedure, the breast is positioned between the x-ray tube and a detector. In a mammography examination, each breast is x-rayed at least twice, once from top to bottom, as well as horizontally, from the outside in. Just like other x-ray procedures, mammography also exists in two different forms, analog and digital both of which result in black, gray, white radiographic images. Of course, these are just some examples of how x-ray is used in a medical environment. There are plenty of other medical situations where x-rays are needed. One example is in the emergency room. After an accident, it's vital to understand as completely and quickly as possible exactly where and how severely the victim is injured. This is called trauma imaging. Here's another thing called molecular imaging, or MI for short. With MI, it's possible to visualize cellular functions and molecular processes in living organisms without impacting normal metabolic activity. Like fluoroscopy, this technique also needs injectable tracers, called radiopharmaceuticals which contain a very low concentration of radioactive substances in order to depict biochemical or metabolic processes in the body. We've talked a lot about the role of imaging-based diagnosis, but modern imaging systems are also increasingly being used for therapeutic purposes. This means that open surgery may be replaced by minimally invasive interventions. The benefit? The outcome can be directly controlled while surgery is still being performed because the clinical images are directly available on the screen in the operating room. So it's possible today to have a heart valve inserted in a minimally invasive way without having to undergo open heart surgery. This allows for quicker recovery after the intervention and lowers the risk for elderly patients. There are also new types of minimally invasive cancer therapies that allow for treatment approaches that are easier on the patient, yet at the same time, effective. I've spoken a lot now about how x-rays are made and used. But what happens then to all these x-ray pictures? Well, in analog radiography, the film that's inside the detector must first be developed in a dark room, like a traditional photograph. Then the physician can review the pictures on a light box and make a diagnosis. Another way to get an x-ray image is computed radiography. Here, a special laser scans the imaging plate and then digitizes the image. Today, however, this step is no longer necessary, as with digital radiography, the x-ray image is taken directly with a digital detector. Obviously, it's much better not having to develop the film before reviewing it. But that's not the only advantage of digital x-ray over analog x-ray. Digital images have higher resolution, so we get greater detail for a more comprehensive diagnosis. Digital images can be digitally transferred and enhanced, a major advantage of the digital system. 
there is a dose reduction effect because digital x-ray requires less radiation to produce images of the same quality. And if an image isn't captured adequately, the radiologist can often digitally enhance the image to meet the quality required for diagnosis. If the same thing happened in analog radiography, this would mean a new image would be needed, and thus a double dose of radiation. So how can digital radiography images be enhanced? First of all, you can zoom into the image to see the smaller details using the magnifying function. You can focus on the area of interest by removing structures that are in the way. This is called reduction. You can use contrast enhancement, altering the pixel values to display various brightness levels, just like when you're editing digital photos on your home computer. Some things are easier to see in a negative image, and with digital images, it's easy to flip between positive and negative. When the image has been post-processed and diagnosed, it has to be stored somewhere. Before digital x-ray, this had always been a big issue. If the physician has them, what does the patient do if he or she changes physicians? And if the patient has them, they can easily be lost or damaged. Well, these problems are now a thing of the past. Images are now stored digitally in a picture archiving and communication system. It's designed for short and long-term storage of the images. The system also helps us find the correct image, and it indicates who's looked at it previously and the diagnosis. It can also be used to display the image and send it to other physicians. This picture archiving and communication system gives us quick and efficient access to images, interpretations, and all kinds of related data. It breaks down the old physical barriers and time problems of traditional film-based X-ray imaging. And it has other advantages too. We save money and space because we don't need hard copy replacement. We have remote access for off-site viewing and reporting. It links up to other medical automation systems as well as workflow management. And most importantly, it guarantees your privacy because images are encrypted during transmission. Well, thanks for taking the time to find out more about x-rays. I think they're fascinating. And I hope that now, you do too. So bye for now. Oh.